I've got about 20 to 30 issues planned. There are some big twists. Strap in, you're in for, a, you're in for quite the ride. Let's talk about how you landed the job on Detective Comics, mm -hmm. because this is, you know, the longest running DC comic. Yeah. Know? I mean, yeah. even though everybody, you know, like everybody thinks of Batman comics, they think of Batman, but really it's Detective Comics, folks. Yeah. Here you are writing, you're paired up with Raphael Albuquerque, mm -hmm. and it is just a stunning looking book. Thank you. So first tell us how, how this collaboration came about. Well, I finished my run on Catwoman, and I was talking to Jessica Chen, who's the editor on Catwoman and now the editor on Detective. Uh, and I said, you know, the next thing I kind of want to do is I want to do something that's on a bigger scale that lets me have more long-term consequences for some of these characters. To me, my motivation was entirely just to challenge myself in terms of the storytelling that I'd been doing. And I, so I, I felt like, you know, let me play with uh, a bigger portion of the sandbox, really. But at the time, you know, there was a different team on the book and I didn't really want to, you know, ask for the book at that time. But it so happened that a couple of months later, there were people shifted books around and, and Jessica was editing the book. She said, hey, remember that conversation we had about you wanting to do something bigger, something on a book like Detective? So can you get me a script two months from now? I was like, oh, that's great. Yeah. The opening pages of this, of course, you know, if you think of Nocturne, you're thinking of things that are operatic and gothic and everything mm -hmm, else. Mm -hmm. So tell, tell us how you kind of conceived that and, and what those opening pages, like if there are specific influences for that as well. I work in, in a strange way. I, I, I would like to tell people that there's some kind of great uh, thoughtful uh, idea behind doing some of the things that I do with these books. But really the reason those pages are there is because as soon as I thought of the story, the first scene that popped into my head was a stage, a spotlight, and a man in a mask standing on the stage. I kind of built that opening scene from that image. I knew it was going to be too hokey to have it be Batman, so I kind of wanted to do this, okay, there is an opera playing for some reason. Then it turned into, a, there is an opera in Gotham. Then it turned into, okay, what am I saying about the character through this scene? Otherwise, it wouldn't have a reason to exist, but, you know, spoilers, but there's a single empty seat in the front row and it said, say it's reserved for Bruce Wayne and Bruce Wayne is not there because clearly he's somewhere else. And I think that just sets the tone for the, for the rest of the issue. Uh, and I'm glad, I'm glad there's that level of trust to put in a scene that has no apparent motivation other than to say, the person you're looking for is not here. What were you listening to when you were working on this? Oh, it's gonna be weird. I was listening to a piece by Pergolesi called Stabat Mater. Uh, which is a very sort of religious composed operatic piece, uh, but it is, is essentially about the suffering uh, of the mother. That's what it says. But the idea that there's a soundtrack about suffering playing while Bruce goes on his infinite nth run through Gotham beating up criminals trying to stop crime, uh, I thought that was a, that was a nice reflection of, of his uh, circumstance in that. Speaking of the criminals in the book, it seems like we're meeting some new villains. Oh yeah, yeah. There okay. will be, there will be, uh, I, I don't know necessarily that I would pose them as criminals. There are definitely new villains in the book. Um, but I was talking about this in a, in a panel earlier today where I said part of the, the narrative inquiry of this book is what, what would happen if someone came into Gotham and did everything Batman was trying to do but did it better? Uh, at what cost do you achieve that? And then if you're Batman, what do you what do you ask yourself? Are you going to reinvent yourself? Are you going to rediscover yourself? Are you going to question your motivations? So they're villains, certainly. I don't know that they're criminals. And I think that is a that is a modern day quandary that a lot of us face even in our real lives. <laughs> but there's a name that kind of just jumps out at me and it's Orgum. Yeah. And just the spelling of that, it just kind of you know, it recalls something else in Gotham City. And are we going to explore that at some point? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that's actually the central piece of the puzzle that it'll become quite apparent to readers that that's what we're looking at quite early on. Um, and part of that is actually a very personal experience uh, in that my name, 
uh, has made, has gone through so many changes because you know I grew up in India, I lived in the States, I moved, I live in London now, and each time I go to another place, my name subtly changes because um, and and sure you can correct people all the time, but also language has its own mind and its own it is a beast on its own, and so. Historically, a lot of the places that we know uh, uh, that the names that we're familiar with are derived from things that are entirely disconnected to what they are now. But the idea of history and the idea of history being different from what we think it is, that's why the name is Orgum. The idea, and you're absolutely right to draw the connection to Arkham, but what we think Arkham is, um, that's what we're kind of diving into with that. There are a couple of elements that kind of are recalling, you know, these these you know these historic Batman comics, but nobody picks up a Rom V comic, like looking for homages to like previous superhero works. So, yeah. but I'm just wondering if there are any like you know if you went back and if there are any touch points in Batman history that you just kind of like wanted to remix or play with as you were composing the story. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, you're right in that no one picks up my book uh, to to get their dose of nostalgia, if you will. <laughs> but uh, the hallmark of my work on on Swamp Thing or even Catwoman uh, has been that there are these references to to existing runs because I think the great joy of working in comics is that you are writing chapter number 452 of some great mythological tapestry that was started decade, decades ago. Um, the Denny O'Neill, Neil Adams run is certainly one of my favorite Batman runs, so you will undoubtedly find uh, more uh, references to it, I'm sure. The Loeb and Sale uh, Batman stories uh, are also big influences. Darwin Cook, big influence. Year One, big influence. So and the animated series for that matter. Uh, so I do wear all of my influences on my sleeve, but uh, they're there not in that they are central to the story and so you must know them to appreciate, but they're there because everything has history and everything is connected. I feel like I see year one and the animated series and the coloring especially in this book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dave's, um, Dave's an amazing colorist. Like the first conversation we had with him was exactly that you know we were sending references to each other and and uh, rafa and i were uh, and jessica were on a zoom call with him and there were literally you know cells of the animated series passed around and say hey this is what we want but then equally there were also biblical paintings and mead schaefer paintings passed around and like okay this, this is what we're trying to do um i genuinely think that the the experience of reading a book especially a comic is absolutely in every single layer of that thing so the colors play such an important role in transmitting the mood and tone and atmosphere of what we're doing i'm fascinated by where you put jim gordon in this story and what you're doing to this poor guy one of the big questions i kind of wanted to to, to answer when when i was starting on this run was uh, alfred what are we doing you know since alfred's like this huge missing character in, in batman's life now uh and for a strangely, and this is going to sound like one of those screenwriter bullpen uh, questions, but for a strange reason, like you need someone in Batman's ear when he is going through Gotham. Otherwise, it's not the same. And my first instinct was to say, OK, we need a character who can play that role, but who cannot be another father figure. And it just made sense. It was perfect in that, OK, if Jim Gordon comes back to Gotham, this is what he would find himself doing. So we're going to see Jim's journey from starting out in Gotham to eventually making his way to, you know, the the old scenario of I'm helping Batman, but is this really constructive for me? When did they tell you that in honor of the start of your run, they were going to redesign the like the logo and the cover of Detective Comics? They didn't actually. Um, it was it was genuinely a surprise. Uh, I saw it. On, so we're all part of this kind of workplace channel, Slack channel. And uh, Jessica just sent it to me and said, this is what we're doing with the design. And it is, it is so amazing. Um, I was talking about that with, with Jock earlier today. And I said, it's great because now there is a, there's literally an icon of my run uh, on the book. Um, people will look at the logo and know exactly what run that, those, that issue is from. 
um, and so it's great uh, you know it's uh, it's great but it's also a reminder of just the kind of the, the magnitude of the book that I'm working on and, and hopefully this this story is uh, deserving of that legacy if you will well enjoy your time in Gotham City yeah my pleasure thank, thank you, you so much <laughs>